Kia ora koutou. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Kishai. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Thank you. So we have one more day, one more full day that we are allowed to campaign in campaign election 2020. How yeah, did no. you get here? <laughs> it's been a long journey, hasn't it? And it's been really strange with this whole sort of early voting stuff going on. Um, half the country's already voted. Yeah, it's really weird being out on the street. And yeah, it's exact, it, it is anecdotally half as well because yeah, half the people are like, sorry, we already voted. Or it's a good out to not chat to politicians and waiting. Who knows? So tonight, what have we got on? We've got a leaders debate. The last leaders debate of this election and arguably very late in the piece. And two days out from the election was an unusual um, calendar decision from the media, but hey, here we are. And if there are still any undecideds who are swinging between national and labor, then I hope they're tuning in to this tonight to see that top is right there in the middle <laughs> to yeah, analyze tonight's event. And we will, um, try and speak mostly in the breaks so you guys can listen to their answers. And um, do you have any special hopes for this evening, Matthew? <laughs> I hope that uh, the serious topics are covered tonight. So, you know, some of the previous debates I've watched, it kind of got to the point where we were debating about what statue we should put where. And I just think that we should really be f focusing on much more of the real sort of systemic issues that are going on in the country. Well, that's just me. <laughs> Wait, you, you want them to talk about real policy ideas? Yeah, real. yeah preferably. Okay. Preferably. Um, well, yeah, we'll see how we get on. Um, yeah. I really hope we get them uh, really uncomfortable when it comes to talking about housing, yes. when they both know full well that neither of their parties have any policies to address our housing crisis. Mm -hmm. and, and just seeing some stats um, that were released today, I think increasing numbers of people going on the job seeker, you know, because in part the wage subsidies are coming to an end, right? You know, and that's, that's going to be the forefront of people's mind who may have just lost their jobs. So I hope something like that is covered. Like, what are we going to do? How is our welfare system going to cope with all of this? That's, that's right. And actually that feature has not, that aspect has not featured in discussions mm. at all, right? Mm. I mean, it's, that should be front and centre. We've been talking about COVID, but it's mostly about the economic recovery, which is an important piece, right? But sort of glossing over the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the Human ones. Human impact. Exactly. And all right, everybody, it looks like they are about to start. So as I said, we will mostly talk to you in the breaks. And I really hope that they give us a debate that leaves everyone more informed. That is my genuine hope. It is debate. There's now just two days left to vote. And this is one of the last opportunities for the leaders to pitch to any undecided voters. I'm very pleased to have an audience tonight here. It feels like a bit of a luxury in this COVID-19 era. And remember, if you're deaf or hard of hearing, you can watch sign language interpreters on Freeview channel 200. But let's start tonight with the latest and final One News Colmar Brunton poll of the the 2020 campaign. 48 hours out, here's how the parties are looking. Labour is sitting on 46, down one from last week's poll. National is on 31, also dropping one. The Greens boost up to eight and ACT is still on eight as well. New Zealand First creeps up to three, but on these numbers won't make it back to Parliament. Now for some of the other parties. The new Conservative Party sits on two and Advance New Zealand, the Opportunities Party and the Māori Party all get one each. These numbers mean Labour would need the Greens to govern and National and ACT would be warming the opposition benches. I want to put these numbers to you first, Jacinda Ardern. You may be able to govern alone or even with the Greens. 
Do you promise this time to be transformational? You sat here three years ago and said that you would. And I believe that we have been. You know, change, real change, uh, requires steps that bring people with us. If we want lasting change on issues like our environment, on cleaning up our rivers, on climate change, we need to try and build consensus and make sure that every three years, the progress we've made doesn't unravel. I've seen that happen before in my time. I don't want it to happen on major issues that require sustained change. But you really sold people on this idea of transformation, and I think some voters got really excited about that idea. Do you promise you will be the I, time? And I stand by my record. Let's take child poverty. Seven out of the nine indicators there, we have turned around and we are making progress. No one for a moment would believe that we could fix an issue that takes decades to build in three years. I am not done yet. I'm asking for people to support us and to I continue want to talk with the progress we've made. More about child poverty a bit mm. later on. But just on the polls, National has an understanding with ACT and Epsom. You haven't done the same with Greens for Auckland Central. This is MMP. Why not play the game? Oh, well, ultimately, you know, we've seen no need for that. We see representation in local seats is really important. Um, but equally, you've seen those parties actually polling strongly anyway, making over that threshold as well. Um, but our view, of course, has been that that local representation matters to us. You've seen in Auckland Central, our candidate has been the top polling candidate. Judith Collins, on these numbers, you're stagnating in the early 30s. Why haven't you been able to bring those national supporters back? Well, I'd say to you, Jessica, there's around about, I think it's 14% of people are either undecided or they've refused to answer the pollsters' questions. I would say a good chunk of those people will make their minds up on election day, and quite a few of those, and certainly that's what they've seen in Australia, around 8% do it in the actual polling booth. And I think there's a lot of people who are going to be looking at it and saying, just how bad is the economy likely to get? And with the uh, International Monetary Fund coming out today and saying that uh, by 2025, another five years, New Zealand is going to be in a significantly worse position than they even were last year, um, I think there'll be a lot of people who will be saying, yes, we want to come uh, and vote National. Earlier in the year, National was sitting firmly in the 40s under Simon Bridges. Would National have been better just to stick with him? Well, I think it was, uh, it's, it's easy to say those things, except that uh, there were no public polls at that time, as you will recall, um, after that. And our certainly internal polling had we us. We did have the, regular Colmar Brunton, well, no, Brunton no, polls our, down our there. General polling had us uh, significantly but the public in the polls, mid uh, 20s actually at that stage. It was quite significant. Um, but also, it was really clear that the caucus decided to change the leader to Todd Muller um, and uh, eventually asked me to do it. So what is your path to power with these numbers? Well, obviously, it's around the 14% who either won't say um, or can't say at the stage. Plus, also, I think it is absolutely important for everybody voting for those minor parties at the moment uh, to understand that the only way to get a national-led government is to party vote national. Um, I think that's really important. People need to understand that their votes will otherwise be wasted. And that is uh, probably not what they expected. I don't think the people voting New Conservatives actually want to have a Labour, Labour Greens government. Um, I don't think the New Zealand First people do either. So is that the strategy here to try and convince well, I think some of those, those people who are voting for smaller parties to see? the number of people who say things like I'm voting for national uh, in my electorate vote but you know do you want me to vote for another party for the party vote because that will help you won't it no it will not but that means the you're only not way to do it across well it I think it's, it's blue it's, with her it's, over she might have seen our ad you know what it's, um, <laughs> we've had MMP since 1996 and still people get this this wonder of whether or not I'm sure that there are people who will vote uh, Greens for their party vote but will, will possibly vote um, Labour Party for the candidate I've certainly seen people who have voted for me um, in the electorate and then voted Greens as well because they think that they, they should do or they think that that will help us. It won't help us. The only way to do it is to party vote national. What's your response to that? You don't seem to agree with that very much. Oh, no. Look, every party goes out and campaigns, particularly the main parties, and asks for two ticks. You know, our message, though, has been very, very clear. And, you know, I'm pleased that we're seeing the support in those polls that demonstrate people are looking for stability.
They're looking for unity. They're looking for certainty. And particularly in these uncertain times, they're looking for a plan. I think in this campaign, it's been so important to demonstrate that New Zealand and indeed the world is facing and not on ourselves. And that's what we've done. All right, a question for both of you. Why do you think that so many people are heading out to vote early? Judith Collins, I I'll think, come to you. Well, I think that there are some people have said that they um, already know how they're going to vote, so they want to go out and do that. Um, there is certainly a traditionally, um, a lot of national voters will vote on the last day. And that's part of the fact that it used to just be the only day that we could uh, vote was on election day. It certainly is part of that sort of community spirit that people often get from voting on election day. Um, I just think some people are saying, well, I know what I want to do now, so I want to, you know, want to go. I just hope they haven't changed, they don't regret, get by re, you know, remorse um, by voting the wrong way before election day. <laughs> why, why do you think? You know, frankly, I actually think people have made up their mind and some people will actually be done with the election. It has, let, let's acknowledge, it's been a long campaign. Um, it had a false start and that's probably made it feel even longer. And I think people's minds are on the future. You know, they want to know what's next. They want to know where we're going to take them as we come through this period that the entire world is facing. And I do get the sense that people are locking in that vote. You know, I think the reason you've got some people in your poll not declaring how they're voting is because they've already voted and they probably want to keep that decision to themselves. But from what I've heard out on the streets, we you know, the instability of keeping us in government. All right, well, we'll wrap this part of the debate up. Later in the programme, I have questions from undecided voters. But after the break, can New Zealand build back better? What will our leaders have in store for the next three years? <laughs> that was a very unusual start to the debate. Yeah, it was just all about polling strategy or, or voting strategy. Um, what has that got think... to do with anything to help people decide how to vote? I just don't know what that to start though with asking Jacinda uh, what has been transformational about her government, a question I asked uh, the mm. Auckland Central candidate last week that I asked that very question on the stage because nothing has been transformational. We haven't seen huge progress on climate change. We have certainly seen no progress, no, not even no progress on housing. Uh, it's, it's just gotten worse. Our housing crisis has gotten worse, so there's nothing transformational there. How can she possibly make an excuse for that? Yeah, I know. Uh, I sort of go back to the polling before COVID, and I remember thinking, because National was polling so high, that I felt like that was a reflection on the lack of transformation that we'd seen from Labour. And, you know, it's just been COVID that has flip things on its head, so to speak. So now we're sort of getting to this point where we're back into thinking whether or not the last three years have been transformational in any shape or form. And they, they this, haven't been. They haven't. This is it. People are not voting Labour to reward them for doing well in any of their big promises because those are the areas where they completely failed. And you've absolutely nailed it on the head. This is a COVID election, as we've heard, and people are probably sick of hearing that, but that is just the reality. It, it truly is that. We are seeing Labour surge because people respect their response and handling and management of our pandemic. Um, but you're voting for more than that. And then it's sort of moved on to saying, what's the path for Judith into Parliament? And it, I wasn't convinced at all that there was one. I don't know. To, to sort of rely on the... 14% who are undecided, and then to sort of talk about picking up a couple of percent of uh, new conservatives doesn't really feel like a path for me. Um, it's a bridge too far for them at this point. Yeah. You no, know, they have a long way to go, whereas we only have a relatively short way to go, actually, when you're looking at the overall vote. Mm. So, yeah, and, we and have. That was part of the, the, you know, we put some advertising out on the major newspapers, right, today mm -hmm. and tomorrow, focusing yeah. on the fact that Labor have arguably won this election just based on their polling, and then it becomes a conversation about who you want to partner with them. That's exactly right. And I think a lot of people are going to be looking at this, and there is this huge 
chunk of voters who really are moving at the moment and are looking for a new home. And maybe they see national as stale or broken or without any good vision or any good policies, which is correct. And they need somewhere to go to hopefully have someone in there to steer Labour in the right direction and at least make progress in these huge areas where they've quite frankly failed. And we need to be able to say that and call it out without people having this fear that we're being anti-Jacinda, which is just not the case. This is, she is a leader. She is not their policy. She is not their party. She's not their team. It's bigger than that. It's much bigger. It's it's the, oh, I need to pay rent this week. How much is rent? Oh, it's gone up 10% in the last year. That's, you know, that's the reality of it. That's the... Uh, that's all that matters to me at the end of the day when it comes to w what I'm judging. If I'm judging transformation, <laughs> I'm judging it on the hard evidence in front of me. Uh, and on that measure, it hasn't been impressive. Not only do we need an economic recovery plan, but New Zealand already has some deep-seated problems to fix. So let's start off with poverty. Jacinda Ardern, this week you promised to halve child poverty by 2030. But the Child Poverty Action Group have told us in preparing for this debate that you could actually fix it right now. You could use that $14 billion pot of money left over from the COVID recovery fund, and you could use that to solve that problem right now. Wouldn't that be transformational? Well, two things I think we need to, uh, two points to make here. That COVID recovery fund, we do need to make sure that we have available, should we need it for resurgence, should we need it to prevent people moving into unemployment, all the things that worsen the issues around child poverty. Second thing is that we have made a significant investment over these last three years and making sure that we're providing things like food and schools, lifting the benefit rates for those who are on the lowest incomes, lifting minimum wage, all the things that make a difference. And we are on track with the targets that we have set ourselves, but there is more we need to do to keep lifting but children. Where's the urgency? That's got to be tempting, having that money sitting there. And there is urgency. We, the first 100 days, one of the first things we did, budget outside of cycle so that we could support those incomes. $5.5 billion. We cancelled the last national government's tax cuts in order to support those on the lowest incomes instead. Now, we did that with urgency because it was one of the most pressing issues and continued every step. But I will well, not fix it, child it poverty is, in three years. Actually, it's another reason I'm asking got for worse. It's got Collins. worse. So it if is you look factually at... No, it is Judith. correct. And it is if factually you look at material incorrect. hardship... If you let her talk, I'll come back the to hard, you. Material hardship, kids in po living in material hardship, which means that they can't get to a doctor in time, things like that, are 4,100 more than they were when Ms Ardern took office. She promised to end child poverty. And the stats that she's talking about actually depend on other people's income coming down because it's a, a medium income. It's got nothing to do with the real hardship that kids are living in. And we've got 150,000 children living in poverty. So if you talk to the food banks, they will tell you things have actually got worse, they haven't got better. So when we're talking about transformational change, it's actually just got worse. Well, well, I, I it is completely incorrect. It is. There are nine measures for child poverty. Seven of them were getting worse under the last government. Those seven we have turned around. Now, I'm not denying there's more to do. That's why food in schools, that's why we've, making, we've heard you point making that out. doctors yeah, visit Judith, cheaper what was Judith important. Collins, what's your target then? The Prime Minister is saying halving child poverty by 2030. What do you oh, say? Oh, we would love to do that too, actually. One of the ways of doing that is getting people into work, getting adults into work, and actually at the same time we're the first. We were the first government to raise real and uh, real um, welfare benefits for people. We were the first ones to do that. And what what Ms. Ardern's forgetting is that, of course, is it's no good. Just income incomes one child, one, one household is, is better off than another child, another household, which is those seven that she's talking about. What really matters is whether or not a child is getting fed, whether or not a child is going to the doctor when they need to, whether or not a child is, has shoes on their feet. That's what matters, and that's material hardship. And there are now 4,100 more children in material hardship. All right, so hardship. you're committing to the same well, we target would, as would love to see. We would actually, no, no, not love to see. Do you commit no, to well, that target? Yeah, as I will tell you, is... 
when you use medium income, child versus median income, you so can't actually yes ever get there. I would obviously thing? like to get that. And Bill English and before me has, but, has also committed to that. We're happy to do that. So you can mention about how we can possibly do it. Yes, we would. We would love but to get there. Jessica, what I'd and say is, is that that requires a plan. You know, actually what I've heard from the National Party during this election campaign is they don't want to see those on the lowest incomes see those incomes increase. They didn't well, support at all. they didn't support the changes that, that we made to benefits and they actually are proposing to make cuts to the Best Start payment, which is all about those children on the lowest incomes. So it's all well and good to say these things, but I see nothing that will we materially change child right, poverty final word program. Here. We've said that we will means test it, but at the same time with our thousand days, first thousand days for a child's uh, life, that is where the big emphasis needs to be. So yes, we would put the money, more money into the first thousand days for a child's life so that mums and their kids can get the best start that right. they can. And as for best start, it needs to be means tested. All right, I want to move on to a topic that a lot of people watching at home will feel passionately about, and that's housing. I asked this question in the uh, multi-party debate as well. Will either of you bring in any changes that would bring down the price of housing? No, they clients? won't. Well, I won't say that we'll bring down the house, uh, price of housing. What I will say is that we'll add supply, which is where we actually can get houses built cheaper. I'm not saying people who have got a house that they've paid a lot of money for, that we're going to suddenly have them lose everything that they've um, saved but for. But lose a bit. Well, it's obvious that if you increase supply, you'll get some drop in terms of uh, pricing if you increase enough supply. But I'm certainly not asking for people to go and lose their life savings, that's for certain. But if we reform the RMA... Who's going to do that, Judith? Who's going to lose like their life savings? Christchurch uh, for the rebuild, we can get that increase. Jessica, it's fair to say for many people, their home will be... <sighs> their asset, you know, and, and that is incredibly important for their financial security. But what we've had a problem with in New Zealand is that we haven't been building at the same time houses in the affordable range for those first home buyers. How now, cute. when we came in, our view was that we had an issue How with juvenile. too much demand. Supply so we tried to take the heat out of the market by stopping foreign buyers, um, by closing tax loopholes and by building affordable housing. Now, today, we can see that CoreLogic has telling us that now first home buyers are making up 25% of the market. That's the highest on record. All our houses so are unaffordable. I stand by what All we've done. Them. We need to keep building, though. We but need to support private it? development so that we keep what getting those affordable homes. What do both of you, though, say to those people watching at home who are thinking, I'm never going to be able you can. to... The best way a lot is around home. supply. A the lot best of... way is around yeah. supply. Whether it is, as we did in Christchurch, we did mass consentings. It's something even Phil Twyford so, thinks is a great idea trouble with Philly can never actually get anything done that's right. the problem but it is important that we focus on how we increase supply okay quickly, that's, quickly, that's to, quickly for me I ask doing. first home buyers you know a lot of them are paying the kinds of rent that would pay a mortgage right now the deposit is a hurdle now, I don't want first home buyers accessing the market to be determined by whether or not their parents can loan them enough money so progressive home ownership our welcome home loan scheme where we've dropped it's down how much right. people or need more fuel will the help house. get people into their housing okay I want to move on to another topic the Māori party have put forward that they want Want to have Māori solutions to Māori problems and when Māori are poorly overrepresented in housing and education and the justice sector, do we need to try a different system, a different way of doing this? Jacinda Ardern first. Yes. Yes, because there are areas clearly where we haven't made progress. You know, good key example for me would be in uh, in the area of state care for children. No one wants to see children removed from their homes, but we also want children to be safe. You know, very recently we saw, uh, we've just launched a program where Fano Order are now working with hundreds of families to prevent children being uplifted. These are the kinds of initiatives that I hope will start turning around those devastating statistics. Do you think we should try something new? Well, we already have with things like rangatahi courts that we brought in uh, for young offenders who are Māori. It's very important too that we address the issues around, um, in some cases, let's say intergenerational extreme poverty and um, also intergenerational uh, welfare dependency, which is, is absolutely crucial that we address Does that. It? So if I look at treaty settlements, one yeah. of the best ways that we can help Māori to actually achieve uh, potential and to have a real feel 
as though and know that they really do have real ownership. 56 treaty settlements under national. That is an enormous number, more than anybody else, any other government's ever done. Are you comfortable, though, with this idea of a separate system? Well, I'm not comfortable with it in terms of a different justice system. What I am comfortable with is what I set up when I was a justice minister, which is things like alcohol and drug courts, whatever works. So when it's things like rangatahi courts, if it is taking young offenders who happen to be Maori and getting them to understand that right. there's a better way... I think you do what, what you have to do to get things through, don't Just, you? Just, that same separate system question to you, does that sit comfortably with you? Yeah, I mean, look, I've seen some of those proposals and instead what I think we should be thinking about is, yes, actually changing the way that we do things. The rangatahi courts are a good example. I've sat in on them. They are exceptional in what they do. But actually, what are we doing to make sure that there's greater partnership? and a seat at the table. You know, when the time we've been in office, we've made sure, for instance, on our district health boards that we have greater Māori representation because we have done a poor job for health outcomes there. And so we should be trying to do things differently. We should be taking a partnership approach. All right, well, we're gonna leave it there. Thank you very much. Coming up, we put out a call for questions from undecided voters and got a huge response. I'll put some of those to the leaders next. So a lot to unpack there, Matthew. Yeah, let's get yeah. focused. I'm Stephen K. Bannon and I was Chief Strategist oh, gonna... to the President. I'm Anthony Scaramucci. Just ask for that yeah. background yeah. music to go off. Okay. I want to start throwing things, shall I? Do it. Get... <laughs> this is all my stuff, so I probably won't, but I've got a keyboard here. Um, just around housing, just around just, well, one, this obsession with trying, focusing on saying that no, that's fine. Everybody else's house is perfectly affordable. We don't have huge amounts of money tied up in them. What we need to do is just build really cheaper houses and that's going to solve the problem. Like it's trying to eat, eat your cake and or have your cake and eat it too sort of stuff. And part of that too was the big focus on progressive home ownership, which we just know, again, is not a solution. It just pours more fuel on the fire by making our severely unaffordable houses easier to buy, but it doesn't actually change the price of them. It doesn't change the fact that, you know, we spend such a huge amount of our incomes on housing costs. It does nothing to talk about stopping housing costs from increasing from the currently beyond severely unaffordable level. I think you've said it before, Matthew, there's no current term, no current international standard to describe the unaffordability measure that we're at at the moment. I mean, affordable is one to three, severely unaffordable. Sorry. It's 5.1 five five. or up. 5.1 or up. And we're up at seven. And Auckland's up at nine. Tauranga is up at up there too. So there was no discussion at all in that little segment about tax. Um, nothing. nothing. They at all. want to convince all of you, that the only thing they need to do is just build, build, build. And what happens when they do that and house prices continue to rise, which is what's going to happen. And over the next three years, house prices will continue to increase probably by another 30%. And you can fool me once. You fooled me back in 2017. I voted for top, but I was fooled into thinking that what the proposal was to fix housing, sure, I trusted our politicians, that that was what the solution would be, that we could eat our cake and have it too or whatever by leaving all these houses and then just trying to tackle a small aspect, building entry-level houses and boom, as long as they're entry-level and affordable, then the first-time buyers could buy them. But that just further exacerbates this sort of housing ladder mentality that we have in this country where housing is the very best investment and even when our incomes are reducing like they have post-COVID, incomes have dropped, house prices are still rising. So if we want to have affordable houses, not only do we have to stabilise our houses, but we've got to ensure that our incomes are catching up too. And anything less than that is just not going to do the job. I, I mean, like you, Matthew, I want to throw things as well. I don't understand anyone who cares about our housing crisis who could be voting for Labour or National. 
I fundamentally cannot get my head around it. If that for you is your greatest priority because you know that our housing crisis is a huge social and economic disaster for our country, you cannot vote for those two parties and, or their it, friends. It, it goes back to the first part of that segment, which I forgot for a moment, about child poverty. There was no discussion yes, around you. what's driving it. You know, no discussion around that housing costs are the major driver of poverty in this country. There was just absolutely no talk. It was just about what form of Band-Aid were they going to focus on. They, they referred to increasing benefits, and they've only done that by $25 a week. They talked about food and skills, all sorts of just ambulance at the bottom of the cliff stuff uh, without actually addressing the fact that we've got some of the highest living costs this country. Our fruit and vegetable growers. I want to ask both of you, would you be prepared to make an exception for fruit pickers to come from the Pacific to help us out here? We are, after all, making exceptions for sports teams. Jacinda Ardern. Um, yes, we would be prepared to look at that. In fact, we are. Uh, but of course, what so we're doing at what we're doing right now, but what we're doing at the same time is looking at those regions that has sh have shortages and matching our job seekers from within New Zealand into those roles too. We have to prioritise getting those who are seeking work into work, but at the same time, no one wants to see fruit rot on the ground. So we have to work with industry and we are. But what, are, are, what we're hearing from growers is that New Zealanders aren't applying for these jobs. They're not putting up their hands. And so we need to look at what the barriers are. I remember sitting down with um, some of our, one of our sectors uh, maybe a year ago who had an issue recruiting pickers. They found that once they changed the shifts that they had, they were able to find those who had caregiving duties because they offered school hours for work. We do need to make sure we've been creative, look at the barriers to work oh, and do trap. everything we can to train and support barriers people into to work. those roles. Because due to fact, right. when I was with you in Blenheim last week, you were hearing that very concern from yes. growers. Would you make this an urgent priority? Yes, we would, and we can't wait around. So with the horticultural um, industry, for instance, they can't wait around uh, because their fruit needs to be picked when it needs to be picked. The same with the... Uh, and also... And if they lose their fruit on the ground or they, they, they rot, basically they also then have to be pruned. So there's, it's not just one year that they lose, it's more. The other thing with the RSE workers is they particularly, they come in from the Pacific. And we know that the Pacific has actually lost all its tourism, pretty much like international tourism, like we have. Right. It is actually part of what we should do as responsible uh, members of, uh, of, of our uh, nations in the Pacific to actually make sure that we have people who okay. are trying to move on to the next willing question. to work and actually so we can house them a viewer asked will your faith play a role in governance well it already does in, in in terms of oh gosh i wish i had done that one better or whatever but I but that's that's you mean some of the comments, some of the personal comments oh no no look you're always going to have a sense of humor with me I am exactly who I was um you know I've always been someone who has been um a what I'd call a liberal Anglican I have always been part of that um and of course do you know what it's nothing wrong with having a sense of humor all right the same question to you Sandra Ardern, what is that I respect people no matter their belief, no matter their upbringing, because I had a similar um, start in my life. And so that has shaped the way I treat people of faith. I respect that. Um, but um, one of the reasons that I uh, am uh, agnostic now is because you know, for me, I wanted to make sure that my religious beliefs didn't get in the way of anyone else practicing what they choose to believe themselves. All right, another question. Will either of you fully fund 
St. John's Ambulance Service, yeah. Jacinda well, Ardern. No question, you know, we have to find a way through on what is a historic so anomaly. So will you fully fund it? We will never lose our St. John's services. I can guarantee you that you will never see a loss of service. Will you fully fund it? We, it is a little more complicated than that, Jessica, because there's some things that they benefit from, from charitable status, but I will never allow St. John's services to be stopped. So Judith, I give you that guarantee. Judith, well, we already have, of course, funding through ACC and having been their minister, I know they get significant funding from that. Um, but as you know, they are a charitable um, institution. I don't think they want to become a government department. I think it's it's absolutely crucial that they retain uh, such a connection to the community that they have now. And I would never also allow them, them to stop. Uh, the, the thought of replacing St John Ambulance uh, with a government agency just should worry everybody. So obviously we'll always make sure that they're properly funded. One of the questions that we got through multiple times uh, when we asked for viewer feedback was people working here on a working visa, they can't bring over their partners mm. because of the restrictions we have. Would either of you consider, with urgency, allowing them to bring their partners across? Judith Collins it's certainly first. something, it, it would have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. And what we've seen um, as an electorate MP, I've certainly seen the last sort of 18 months is really hard to get any um, any any partners over or anything else for people. But um, I think we need do need to always look at it in a case by case. Otherwise, it's just basically open slather. And I don't think that's right for New Zealand either. I still think it's important for us to to think for a moment how lucky we are to even be having this kind of debate right now. The fact that we are talking about who it is that will be coming in and working within New Zealand safely and openly is testament to the fact that our COVID strategy has worked. That has meant making trade-offs at the border. Our restrictions are part of the reason that we are safe and that we are sitting in this room together tonight. So I stand by that. We have progressively moved to bring in additional people outside of our residents and citizens as we've been able and I imagine we will continue to do that. This final question is from a student at West Rolleston School in Canterbury and we got multiple very strong questions in from that particular school but this student question is from Lucas and he says what's something you have to give to the country you have to give to the country that <coughs> no one else does? Jacinda Ardern. Oh, that no one that no one else does. He didn't emphasize that. That was my interpretation. Oh, no. Sorry, yeah. Lucas. Yeah. Sorry, Lucas. Do you know, I think actually probably in part what I bring is an acute awareness that of course we are in this job as a privilege, you know, and not by right. And so that means that I know there are other people who could do this job. So I never take for granted that I'm here. I give my everything. No matter what is thrown my way, no matter what crisis is thrown my way, you will always be assured I will give my everything to this job, even if that means a huge sacrifice. Judith Collins. Well, just being in the job is an utter privilege. Um, I've been in uh, the role of a minister as an MP um, over the years, but I've also bring with my with me not only uh, experience as 20 years as a lawyer, but also a lot of that time, most of that time in, in small business. So I bring real business experience and also um, public company directorship experience as well. So that at a time of grave economic uh, situation that we are moving into now, according to all all of the international commentators. That is something that I bring, but also the ability to make decisions. Oh, that, I make, that's I a make long decisions. list for Lucas. It's <laughs> very a lot. Kind. I oh, hope you know, that answers. It's 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 Lucas, Lucas, very, Lucas. very, very quickly. Lucas, probably as well though, and I imagine actually from the conversations I've had with you know, our next generation, they want us to look beyond the here and now. And I think in the middle of a circumstance like the one we're in, yes, we have to manage the COVID crisis as it stands, but we have to look to Lucas's future too. And we have to think about all of those challenges, right. environmental sustainability, right. yeah. training yeah. and so on. And that's also well, Good what job, I can Lucas, do. you sparked a, a lot of debate there. I enjoyed that, but we're gonna have to leave it there. One of these leaders will form the next government, but under MMP, they'll need some help. Next, I'll ask the leaders about negotiations and bottom lines. Hey everyone, I'm, we're really sorry about the sound and it's going to get a little bit turbulent, just like being on the plane, if we remember that pre-COVID world, um, and Kane and the team are going to try and re-sync up our sound, so please thank you for your patience and please try and bear with us, I don't know what this turbulence will look like for you, but I really appreciate you sticking it out with us. 
while we try and fix this. Strap yourselves in, everybody. Um, so there was a few things that they talked about then. Uh, big one was about the fruit on the trees that needs to be picked. And this is very interesting because, I um, mean, we've been doing some work in this area. We did a, a press release uh, last week or this week about, you know, TOPS proposal is to make abatements and stand down period, periods, abolish them for the summer period, therefore getting people into work. Because right now, of course, if you're on a benefit, uh, you work some you work, you earn some money, but your benefit goes down. So you're no better off financially. And people, there's a lot of people who aren't quite familiar that this is the case and that this means that there's very little incentive to work, very little incentive to find a place, um, childcare, for example, or very little incentive to spend money to, to travel to some of these places, which tend to be, you know, uh, quite a wee way out. So by making the benefits unconditional it means you get to keep them and therefore when you go and work you actually get rewarded for it and there was just no discussion at all about the welfare trap or abatement rates in that entire segment <laughs> on twitter i feel like i'm the only guy talking about them because people will say well uh you know we just got to pay them more and that's fine sure that can be an element of it but the employer is paying almost, they're throwing money into this sort of never, this endless pit because they're trying to um, combat the abatement rates. They chuck more money, but the employee doesn't see it. Just that's the nature of the abatement rates. So, you know, why, this is not a problem that's going to be fixed by simply throwing more money at it. If we make that benefit unconditional, then Sorry if you guys have that sound back for you as well. They're just trying to get this right. Okay, Kane, can we mute the ads for everybody? There's also discussion about St. John's Ambulance. Do you know much about that, Shai? Um, look, I haven't looked into how we could propose to fund it, um, but... <laughs> My, my, there you go. Yeah, my understanding from listening to Talkback for a while there, um, a period of my life where I, I listen to it a lot, um, they're not that keen for it to be funded because, like was mentioned there, they enjoy charitable status. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's that clear cut. Obviously, top would be very, uh, as much as we don't focus on the ambulances at the bottom of the cliff, we've got to make oh, sure that our, <laughs> we've got to make sure our ambulances are funded. Um, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. We need to ensure that they are always resourced to the extent that the society needs them, for sure. Um, I'm just going to change the light. Oh, gosh, sorry. Bear with me, everyone. Some tech issues tonight. You'd think we would have not had... <laughs> so, Shai, can I throw you a question? Okay. Um, what would you bring to the country that's unique? This is one of the questions they asked, so. That was a really. It was a curly one. Curly question. What would I bring that is unique? Um, I think the fact that I don't really have a filter uh, would be unique for a politician because I tend to just say exactly yes. what I'm thinking. So hopefully that would be a good thing because people need to see politicians being honest. Um, so I think we can change the way that we behave if we're just always saying what we think. <laughs> Within reason, I try and hold the swears back sometimes. <laughs> yeah, which is why you make me smile, I guess, all the time. <laughs> That's, it's totally what it is. It's just, it's just, you're telling us exactly how it is. So it's brilliant. What about you, Matt? Oh. We're going to go back. Oh, we... I've run out of time. We're going to BRB, everybody. Hopefully it'll work this time. See you soon. <laughs>
Hi everyone, thank you so much for staying with us. We're really sorry they haven't been able to fix the audio. So we're really hoping you'll forgive us this one night and just stay with us through the rest of the debate. And we're gonna pick back up where we left off so you won't have missed any of it. And thank you so much for your patience. And Kane will bring it up in just a momento. And he's just getting it to the right spot to make sure we haven't missed any. Um, let's hope that the rest of the debate actually hears some policies because so far tonight we haven't heard any how things will be achieved really. We've just heard a lot of um, kind of general ideas and general goals um, without sort of the substance as to how these issues will be fixed. All right, hopefully Kane's got it now. A strong position. So let's talk about Great, that now. Kane. Jacinda Ardern, will you implement the Greens wealth tax? No. Mm. They say they're bringing it to the negotiating table. And I've made my view absolutely clear. Uh, New Zealanders deserve certainty on something as important as tax policy. What about any the suggestion, tax, any suggestion uh, that is counter to what I've clearly stated time and time again is mischievous and frankly desperate. What Judith Collins, you've tax? heard her talking there. Yeah. Do you believe her? What I, I believe that she will in fact implement, if she gets a chance, uh, one of the, the Greens uh, tax uh, requests. So they've got, for instance, a top tax rate going up to 42%. But the wealth tax though. Well, I absolutely believe that they're going to do it. Why? Because James Shaw, Chloe Swarbrick, even, even uh, the Labour Party um, Minister Penny Henry has said so that they'll be talking Judith, about I'm capital gains call you tax out on this. this has been happening for no. two weeks now. Well, it is a desperate political <laughs> strategy to try and get votes, and it is wrong. It's we said wrong. that we would campaign on fact, that we would well, play haven't. it straight. This oh. is a blatant campaign of misinformation that I'm putting an end to. I've made my view absolutely clear and clear my intention absolutely clear. You can't to make any transformational change. It's just wrong. to say that when Correct. you know that the Greens and their welfare policy that they want to put in will add another $12 billion a year to the welfare budget, how can you possibly afford and to act. give them what they want? But I want to put a want question to freeze here. the minimum Judith wage Collins. for three years and act if, on a flat tax rate. Will National implement that? No, we've we that campaign we on our issues we, and I've made clear what I I will not implement and what we well, hear will you is put up mischief. the top tax rate that, that is labor's policy we have what a you'd policy put it up no no the no to 42 percent two percent so 42 no. percent for anyone over 100 judith as so I let said. me put this question to you then judith collins if you rule something out would you expect us to take you at your word and why aren't you taking well, you see, you first? might you <laughs> might ask that and i'll tell you this because time and time again during the last election debates Ms. Uh, Ms. Ardern promised and Labour promised that they were going to do certain things. And actually it gets to the stage where you've had so many promises made and almost no delivery, you whether it was Kiwi Build, Jessica? whether it's child poverty, Jessica? whether it was, what was it? Politics, oh, just under our Politics no, no. of course, is a place where you'll have a lot of back and forth. But I would never stand here and blatantly call someone a liar. And that is unfortunately what well, Judith I, Collins is doing now. I, I would not do that. I'm sorry, I have given my I have given my word we here, start to say this. And that is what I'm sticking How to. How many broken promises? It doesn't matter what you've promised, essentially, whether it's it light rail matter. to the airport, whether it's light rail up to uh, West Auckland, it whether matter. it's Child poverty Are you reduction. just trying to You're scare just voters, though, Judith Collins? Delivered. No, absolutely not. It is important to understand that the Greens have extremely expensive promises that they're making to their voters, including a $12 billion increase in the welfare budget. All right, well, let's, let's, let's flip year. this so round. We, to just, I want to flip this question around because... ACT is wanting to slash spending, is wanting to bring in a very austere budget. So would you take that on? They're going to be coming in with 10 MPs on our numbers. Well, we've said to them very clearly, there's lots of things that we can talk to them about and agree on, such as Resource Management Act and building reform, such as cutting red tape, such as, for instance, the extra $700 million that's currently being spent every single year now in the bureaucracy of Wellington under the Labour-led government. And, that and won't be happening. And Judith, so, you expect and voters to take to. you at your word. Well, and absolutely, this is why because everyone knows 
most Labor, no, I do. The Labor on has, what I say. Labor, you don't. Labor That's has always campaigned on na against Nationals' policy and on Nationals' proposals. We have never made an assumption that by default everything ACT proposes will happen. We ask that they don't do the same to us. I have been absolutely clear on this issue multiple times but you also said and I will continue build, light to be rail and everything else you this is and a failed. desperate tactic no, and frankly all right sad. I want to put a question to both Did of you say frankly if sad <laughs> Peters is in the mix after the election would you work with him again just under our dirt? yeah I've said look I've shown that I could work both with New Zealand first and both with the Greens does that idea please you Oh, I will make whatever New Zealand voters deliver work. Um, what I am very clear on, though, is that we will get things done faster, All right. fast, with a strong mandate, and that's what the I'm asking for for Labor. for you, Judith Collins. Would you work with Winston Peters? Well, we've, our caucus has made it very clear that they're not uh, willing to sell um, out so much to Winston but, Peters. But let's be realistic here. If he's the only option, you'd work with him, right? No, I think it's really clear to also understand that the last election, uh, the negotiation, it was very clear that National was not going to give in to uh, Mr Peters as much as the Labour Party And you've was. sat on the opposition benches for three years? Oh, do you know what? Um, there's a lot worse than being on the opposition benches. You know what it is? It's doing the wrong thing for New Zealand. The right thing to do is to stand on principle. All right, I want to ask about climate change. The Greens are saying they want to go further and faster with climate change. And some people feel very nervous about that. What do you say to those people? Well, I'd say that actually this is our chance to turn what has been, of course, framed as a crisis into an opportunity for New Zealand. And that's what we've built the foundations for over the past three years. We do need to keep going, though. You know, we trade alongside our exporters on our brand. It's an inevitability, oh, of course, that we do need to make changes to move our energy use and our electricity generation to clean tech that's what we have a plan for, but we benefit as a country when we do that. So let's look at it as an opportunity because it is. Well, another topic that the Greens aren't very keen on is GE technology. But farmers have come out and said, look, we should be taking advantage of this. It could really help us when it comes to climate change, things like growing yes, trees faster or changing Correct, feed Jessica. so that you don't have cows don't have so much methane yeah. and gas. Is GE some technology something you would consider, Judith Collins? Well, we've made it very clear that we should at least have the conversations with the country about uh, using science because actually one of the reasons we are such a force when it comes to agriculture and horticulture is over the years we have used science to actually produce crops better, uh, be bigger and more cheaply. But also it is important if we are very concerned Does about things like methane that we would, for instance, have the rye grasses be being All right. uh, looked at the tested here rather than having to go to the States. Very quickly, doesn't she have a point there? Oh, and look, I, I wouldn't disagree with the idea that we should have that discussion as a nation. My view is that there is a way where we can make sure that we protect some of the the brand that New Zealanders trade on. Yes and or no, Jacinda? Science or sector not? That's very important to them, whilst not losing the opportunities that exist, both for methane reduction, but also pest management. So there is a way through on this. I want to see if I can get quite a quick answer from both of you. Good if I can squeeze it in. Thank you. Um, I wish myself luck too. When the borders <laughs> do open, uh, the Māori Party is saying don't let anyone come and immigrate until we sort out the housing problem. New Zealand First is saying 10 to 15,000 and what's your number, Judith Collins? Well, uh, what we could cope with, actually. Um, we we were in office, we thought it was about 50,000, um, but you can't do it without getting housing in place. We've also said, too, that we would let people come in who are going to be building, getting housing right. in here for other people to use. Just under our turn. Now, I'm not going to give you a number, but what I am right. going to say is that we can't use immigration as a way to stimulate our economy. We need to bring in skilled people. Uh, we need to, to keep care. fulfilling our refugee right. obligations, but we also need to house everyone. All right. And thank you've you done very nothing much. to address so that. So final questions years. are after the break, and the final word from both of the <gasps> leaders stay with us. That was um, an interesting discussion. And I'll just wait for that. Thanks, Kane. Um, so I think, Matthew, that conversation, you know, around National trying to talk about the Greens wealth tax policy as if it's Labour's, uh, and then the Prime Minister talking about X policies um, as separate to Nationals. But the what really screamed out from that whole conversation was that 
the Greens, because they're tethered to Labour and ACT, because they're tethered to National, have not only no bargaining power, but it's that they have no say over what policies are actually going to be implemented in the following three years. None. Zero. Their big brother, Labour mm. or National, decide. Yeah, it's just they, like... Ah! Yeah, it's just like a suggestion. Oh, we should maybe tax wealth. No. Uh, and, and that's it. That's, <laughs> and that's it. it. Uh, all and that policy development work uh, goes to nothing. Mm. It goes to nothing because they give themselves no bargaining power. They refuse yep. to work with the other brother, only their brother, and it's a nightmare for them. Yeah. and their supporters and what a wasted vote and everyone says top you're a wasted vote at least if we got there we would get some of our policies across because and there was the discussion progress. of Winston Peters he you know he's enough of a uh you know a player in this that they were able to ask both Jacinda and Judith would you rule out working with them because you know they've been through it last election and they that was some pretty hard negotiations I'm sure Labour and Green, the negotiations lasted half an hour compared to that, you know, it was it felt like a mm -hmm. month, but maybe it was only a couple of weeks. That oh, it felt like a long time. Just So the thing is, we don't want the Greens wealth tax anyway. Uh, all no, it will do is put even larger taxes on businesses that we've already got in this country and do nothing to fix the differential, the distortion in our tax system that incentivizes us to throw our money into property. So we don't want it. And it I mean, if we- get worse. Yeah. If, if we want to be optimistic here, then Jacinda has ruled out a capital gains tax, fine. Didn't want that anyway. She's ruled out Green's wealth tax, fine. Didn't want that anyway. But there is still scope that, um, you know, some actual sensible tax reform, like what Top's suggesting, just like the same that was suggested for the tax working group back in 2001, for example, or even a land value tax. You know, optimistically, I'm saying to myself that she's been very clear on which taxes she won't adopt, uh, leaving the good ones that available. nobody's suggested yet. Um, available to actually fix the problem. Yeah, and I think it was interesting that Judith then tried to go after the Greens welfare part of their their policy, um, which she said she was referring to the number of 12 billion as being the cost there. Um, but, you know, I genuinely think TOPS UBI have a better shot of being passed by Labour than Greens GMI, quite frankly, because it's an idea that the new Conservative ex-national voters who Labour have recently been able to corral into their team could get behind, whereas they're not going to get behind the GMI. Yeah, well, the GMI is way. extremely ideological because it's picking up money here and shoving it over here. The UBI is just picking it all up and then depositing it unconditionally to everyone. Uh, and you fairly know. and simply. Yeah. <laughs> um, and is it Bat Kane? Okay, thank you. There was also yeah. a brief discussion about austerity in terms of X policies. Uh, you know, that's, that's just as dangerous. Welcome as... back. We're nearing the end of the they, debate. They're we'll terrible. The final pitch well. from the leaders shortly. Here we go. First, I want to talk to both of you about leadership. Firstly, Jacinda Ardern, if you become Prime Minister next week, will you stay on for a full term? Yes. If you become, if you don't win, would you stay on as leader of the opposition? No. Judith Collins, if you don't become prime minister next week, why should National keep you in the job? Uh, because I'm doing a very good job. Um, nobody can say that um, I'm not putting everything into it. And I think that we need very strong leadership and we need someone who can make um, decisions. And I'm that person with the experience to do it. Do you feel unfairly like the knives are out for you a bit already? We've seen leaking. <laughs> Is that a bit unfair? No, I just think that um, that's the life of opposition. I think it's also very important that I'm focused on the people of New Zealand. I don't try and get distracted or anything else. I've been around long enough just to keep my eye on the ball, which you, is actually the people of New Zealand. Do you think you've got backing? Yes, absolutely. I know I have backing. We are in a unique position here tonight. We have two female leaders of our political party. What are you both doing to make sure that there are more women in leadership 
positions. And Judith Collins, do you even see that as an obligation that you should fulfil? You know, I do because I think it's really important to have uh, women coming through. Do you know what I really like? Would be if one day there are two leaders of major parties and nobody thinks, who are just happening to be women, and nobody thinks that's of any any importance um, because they'll think, well, well, of course, why, why wouldn't you? Um, I just think that it's really important to bring other people through as well. And, uh, and I always will always promote on merit. And I think you've seen that in the reshuffle that I did when I took over. Yes, I, I do think we have obligations there. I think our job is to make sure Parliament is a representative place. So making sure that our parties, you know, reflect New Zealand and our Parliament reflects New Zealand. That means making sure that you have women, Māori, Pacifica, that we have people with experience of disability. That's all important if we are to make sure that we're making decisions that reflect New Zealand's needs and interests. Like we've mentioned in this debate, it has been quite a long campaign. What are you both not going to miss about this period, Jacinda Ardern? Oh, I, I do enjoy campaigning. I do, genuinely, um, because, you know, in the rigour of Parliament, we don't necessarily uh, get as much time as we do in a campaign out talking to people. And that's been helpful for us to make sure that we are in our COVID recovery, it's really tiring, reflecting though, people's right? needs. But actually, um, politics, you know, what we give to this job, that's what it's like all of the time. You need that stamina uh, because none of us are here for a long, long time time so we have to give our all for the time we are here judith collins i was just well, thinking of winston peters there some people well, are some here for a long, long time there, there, are, smile. there are some, some exceptions are, you do have to give up an awful lot i tell you what i i i, I won't miss uh, with not having to campaign is um not being home to have dinner every now and again with my husband and son i think that's something that i i, I have been missing um but i really love my work so much i love doing public meetings i love doing things like that um, you know, I just, I, I really enjoy it. I love meeting New Zealanders and listening to them. One so. thing that I was quite we curious. we especially love the debates. Yeah, we do. Oh, actually. especially, don't we? I mean, yeah, I was waiting for that. Come on. No, how long did it take? I hadn't even thought, because I have been enjoying them. <laughs> and I, just think, I mean, know, how long I mean, did it take? Both of you, seriously. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing I'm really curious to ask you about, you don't get the chance to sit next to each other that often. What's one thing you'd both like to say to each other? <laughs> Uh, that one. That's yeah. good. Actually, I, I have something. It's actually been, it's been a long time since this happened, but I've never had a chance to thank Judith for the speech that she gave after March 15. Um, in the House, she gave an incredibly sincere, authentic speech about the need for us to move on gun law reform. Uh, I found it particularly powerful, and I, I do want to thank Judith for that. Is there something you would like to say to yeah. Jacinda Ardern? You know, I just think that anyone who takes on the job of uh, Prime Minister has to put their heart and soul into it. And, and Jacinda has been doing that. And I think, you know, that's a really good thing. I don't think anyone should ever take the job uh, lightly. And, uh, you know, I think we, we can say that that's a great thing. Let's, I want to ask you as well, we look beyond this bubble that we're all in at the moment. What's a goal you have beyond politics? I'll ask you first, Judith oh, Collins, and then for you. What, to beyond, right like for ourselves personally? Yes. Gosh, oh, or, or even, or even <laughs> career-wise? Um, I mean, I'll tell you what, Saturday, which I'll is certainly a challenge. be writing another book, Jessica. <laughs> I mean, goodness, already got a bestseller and need another one. But <laughs> it'll have to wait a little while because I'm just so busy. <laughs> Jacinda Ardern, what's like this your... This will be a good chapter. This a good chapter. <laughs> what's your goal beyond politics? <sighs> I want politics to change and whether or not I'm I'm in it trying to change it or whether or not I'm outside of it, I still want to play a role in that. You know, one of the things that I've loved the most about this election is the number of conversations I've had with children about their interest in politics. But I don't take for granted that it's a given that will stick. I want I want our young people to look at this place and say you can do positive things, that it doesn't have to be about mudslinging. And I want our nation not to be completely polarized. Now, actually relative to other countries, we do a pretty good job on that. But, with, but that's with what I, I want to keep contributing to that. and things like that. I mean, flicking of insults and things like that. We have, I mean, we've seen a little bit of that tonight. We've definitely oh. seen some of that this week. That's politics. Oh, look, huh? you've got to have robust debate. No one's denying that. And that's all a part of it. Um, but I, I also want it to be a place where people can see themselves. And that means d diversity in the way do people do the job. Politics has to be entertaining as well. I think that's really important. Otherwise, people just what? turn off and they can't be bothered. Um, so it's got to be entertaining. But it's actually also have 
waste substance. And so when we're talking about the right. policies, we do need to have, have to, to do that as well. So, you know, I think politics is, is the most interesting uh, career that I have had. Um, and I've had uh, careers in law and in business. And I just find it a most thrilling and exciting thing. So every day I wake up, Jessica, I All really right. do have a smile on my face. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Permanently. Now yeah. is... <laughs> <laughs> and it's going all day. <laughs> now you get a chance to directly go down the barrel of the camera and talk to those viewers at home. I'm going to give you a minute each to make your pitch to those voters. Jacinda Ardern, your minute starts now. After several debates and a very long campaign, some of you may still be undecided. Some of you may have never voted for Labour before. And my message is for you. Now, every vote for Labour is delivering strong and stable government. And that's what we need right now. You know, that means a focus on economic recovery. It means getting more done faster. And we've achieved a lot together, but now is the time to look at the opportunity that lies in front of New Zealand too. Investing in our people, supporting our small businesses, backing our exporters and moving towards becoming clean, green and carbon neutral. But to achieve all of that, we need that stability, we need certainty, and we need a plan to take us forward. That's exactly what's required in uncertain times. And that's why I'm asking that we stick together, that we keep moving, and that you party vote Labour. Judith Collins, your minute starts now. Thank you. Um, thank you for watching tonight. So it is really important that if you want a national-led government that you party vote national. It is crucial because we are about and are moving right now into very difficult economic times. We need a party that understands business. We under need a party where the leader can make very uh, decisive uh, decisions regarding what happens to our economy. We need a party that understands business and getting people into work. So our plan is all focused on the economy, growing the economy so that we can actually have jobs for our children and grandchildren and paying down debt, not the 15 years of deficits that we have from uh, the Labour Party. It is really important that our children want to have a future here and that they're not saddled with debt that is unnecessary. So party vote national for a big technology sector, an economy that's growing, and infrastructure that works for you. All right. Well, there you have it. Thank you very much to the leaders and thank you very much to our audience. Get out and vote if you haven't done that already. You can join the One News team for our election night special on Saturday from 7pm. Those results are go going to roll in quickly and we'll be right across it. Thanks to the team in the studio and in the control room. Good night. Righty, oh wow, there you have it everyone. That was the last debate in this election. You have two more days to go out there and vote. And what did we learn this evening? The same question I ask at the end of every <laughs> single one of these debates. What we what we're um we're what we we learn or what we're put put forward is two options and that's just not the case you know it's a sort of a false choice going on here where you're like well it's either this one or it's this one but that's not how it sure that might make your decision easy because you just have to pick between the two but we should probably be talking about all the options on the table uh and that's that's why debates with just these two parties are just so artificial, especially with how low nationals polling now anyways. And it didn't it meant that we didn't get a quality debate on policy at all. I mean at all. Like what is either of them going to do to achieve these hopes and dreams that they have laid out their vision? That's all great, but we are not voting for a feeling. And that minute from Jacinda is asking you to vote for a feeling, not a plan, not policies, this. And this is lovely. And she's done a good job as being a, a leader, but you're not voting for that. You are voting for outcomes that affect Kiwis each and every day. And our lives have gotten harder over the last three years because they do not have the courage to have the policies that are gonna work. And I've said this before, and I will say it again. Jacinda is not a policy. She is not a team. 
we need to move away from this almost fanfare obsession and and just have some objectivity again. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was a thing, right? For nine years, we had national. It was such a long period of time that you forgot what Labour was like. And so arguably as a country, although Winston Peters basically had the last say in that, we switched to Labour. And it's so fresh in our minds because it's only been three years that this election is very interesting. Do we take these two leaders, their promises, their words at face value? We probably shouldn't if we look back over the last three years and think about what has improved. You know, housing was such a big focus in 2017. It was a huge focus for both parties on, you know, fixing that issue. And an issue that's only gotten worse. Yeah, because, Shai, you're at an open home today, right? Mm -hmm. Not and to buy everyone in case you missed it. Yeah. Just to be clear, I am a renter and not looking to buy. <laughs> um, but it was not, how much was it going for? Okay, so to put it into perspective, it was a very small, tidy, but very small two-bedroom house in uh, Pakaranga, and it is going to go for at least $810,000. Mm. Advertised as an entry-level home. Yep. Entry-level. That's and, close to a million dollars. Yeah, what was its valuation? 790. 90, yeah. Two years ago. Two years ago. Three years ago, I think. Yep. So we know house prices are just going up and up. And we've got to ask ourselves, well, if they've just been going up and up and up and up and up, surely we need something fundamental to change that trajectory. You know, it can't just be more tinkering around the edges. The, the solutions they're proposing this time around are even less grandiose and transformative as <laughs> last election. It's almost like they've given up promising. They have given up. Oh, my gosh. That is it. Mm. You have just nailed it. They have given up. So they at least didn't sit there pretending that they can fix it. And maybe that's why I shouldn't be so annoyed with how inadequate that conversation was. They're just not pretending anymore. Mm. Who out there is rewarding that absolute failure with their vote like why are you doing that why i just i don't understand the logic of saying you know what you've given up fixing our one of our biggest issues but that's okay have a vote well, but, but, but maybe you know understandably it's not that clear cut because jacinda at least you know they well she must have given up given that she's not taking the advice of the tax working group she's not taking the advice of what we really need to do to to tackle the restrictions on the supply at least she is saying the right words right both of them are saying the right things um there's not any depth behind it um there's no plan behind it because we know like top wouldn't come with a comprehensive plan if it didn't take a comprehensive plan we wouldn't talk about the six different things we need to do in this country to fix this festering wound that's been growing for 30 years. If it didn't take six things, we'd love it if it was a snappy slogan. It's not. The, 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 the snappiest slogan we can get is we can stabilise house prices for our wages to catch up, therefore restoring affordability to our housing market. That's the best we can do. But behind that, there's a whole lot of pages of uh, you know you think about the supply policy that alone's a good 15 pages worth of reading because this is not something that's going to be fixed overnight but what we can do is actually make the transformational change that's required to undo mm. the harm and that's the difference having a plan versus having hopes and dreams basically and the thing is is that we're going to have three years of nothing changing nothing changing and people don't wondering do why don't do don't do it to be shy i don't want, i don't want another three years where can i where and can do you I? know what no one wants another three years uh, of this 
No yeah. one out there wants another three years of our problems getting worse yeah. from now, which is just so hard to imagine what another in three years would look like. But you have the power to have a voice in there who will demand every single day action that will work, not just mutterings and complaining, but actions that will work. And do you know what I want to say this? People say to me, oh, but the Greens will be in there and they care about people. That's lovely. They do. They genuinely do care about people. And that's excellent. But that doesn't mean they have the plans that will fix it. And also, if they're going to be as part of Labour's team, they don't spend that time complaining. They don't spend that time critiquing them. And I think we've seen that the last three years. There has not been critique from within their team because, like I said before, they're the little brother to the big brother and they just kind of copy them. Get into line. Get into line. So you don't get that. So what is the point of having them there when they're not going to make sure that they're steering? Well, they one can't steer the government in any direction that they want because they have no power. And then when they don't get their way, they just follow suit. So what is the point? What is the point? Okay. And so maybe a counterpoint here would be like, oh, shy, you don't understand. We need more Green MPs. The issue is that we don't have enough Green MPs. But... On any polling that we're seeing, we're not seeing the double amount of Green MPs that apparently it will take to get this change that they're wanting to do. So, Well, their plan wouldn't work even if they had 50, but that's not the point. <laughs> so, so, you know, we're at this point saying, well, our only option is really to have that real leverage that comes from not being tied to the big brother and saying, Here's the plan, and this is what we're putting forward. It's up to you now, major party, whether or not you take it. We don't want fancy roles. We just want you to take this advice from the experts that we've read that was available to you, and we've now put it on the table for you to implement. And the only other party that had that power was Winston in 2017, and they are the opposite of progress. They want no progress for our society or our economy. And that is the harsh reality. And it's so sad to say that. And that's the truth. They take pride in stopping Labour doing stuff. That is not constructive. You're doing that on our time and money. That's not constructive. That's not fixing problems. And... The, the days are numbered. I think they know that. And we, on the other hand, are on the rise while they're not. This is, this is, yeah. So, you know, two days left. Now's the chance. Because, look, half the country hasn't voted yet. They've got a, a, you know, a decision to make on voting day, who they vote for. Top at this point is not a wasted vote for the reasons we've outlined just now. Like the top is the vote that signals change, that signals, hey, look, I like what these guys are doing. I want more of this. We know that purely by signaling to the major parties, look at the Opportunities Party. Here's their policies. Here is a significant number of Kiwis, albeit not you know, over 50%, but a good chunk of Kiwis who support and want this. And that's the only indication that we need to give to the government is to say, look, it's it's just like polling, right? We know the major parties poll because they want to know what's popular. And we need all our supporters to show their support on voting day so that we can signal to the major parties we need actual transformational change. We need real change and we need it now. So if you're sitting there watching this right now and you have been tinkering and you don't know if you can commit your vote to top, if you genuinely want these issues to be fixed and you want to send a message, as Matthew says so well, the best way to demand change is to vote for the party calling for it. Everything we exist for is for fundamental change to those underlying issues. 
and you will not send the message that that's what you want if you vote for parties not offering it. The only way you tell them that you are wanting a better and fairer future for our country is to put that on the ballot paper. And it might feel scary, but your vote, voting for top, is far more powerful than just being one of a bunch of people who just happen to vote for Labour for who knows why. But your vote will matter so much more if it is for top. We don't have that far to go to get to that 5%. If you just commit and be bold and be brave enough this election to say enough is enough. I am sick and tired of seeing this direction of this country and I have the power with my vote to change it. You need to vote top. And with that, we will play you our video, our campaign video. And Matthew, it has been an absolute pleasure. Wait, before you do that, Kane. Um, I, Matthew, I just yes. want to say to you, it has been an absolute pleasure working with you this campaign. And I'm so glad we got to do one last live together this yeah. year. It's, it's been fun. Likewise, Shai. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be doing these streams with you and having this discussion and actually having an opportunity, a platform to talk about these issues that so many Kiwis share. Well said. To everyone out there, thank you so much for tuning in, for listening to us. And Jeff and I will be back for one very last uh, session with you tomorrow. So take care out there and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Kane. October 17th is the day you get to decide what you want for Aotearoa New Zealand. 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years in the future. TOP has a plan to tackle the biggest issues in our society. We're a team of experts, not politicians. We're scientists, economists, lawyers, small business owners. We bring in a universal basic income, $250 a week for every adult Kiwi, no questions asked. This gets rid of the welfare trap and allows people to retrain, start new businesses and rewards unpaid labour like household work and volunteering. TOP's housing and tax reforms would hold house prices and rent stable for a generation. New Zealand needs property owners to pay their fair share of tax. We need more quality medium density housing around active and public transport networks. We also need stronger renters' rights so everyone can call their house a home. Small businesses are the backbone of New Zealand's economy. To help them thrive, TOP will abolish provisional tax. We'll help businesses with digital uptake and energy efficiency and give them access to universities and polytechnics to solve their problems. You know, the COVID recovery, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to, to build back better than we were before. We can improve the environment and have a thriving economy. This is what real progress looks like and businesses can be part of the solution. Aotearoa New Zealand is a taonga, it's a treasure. Decades of old school thinking has given us the problems we face today. Let's make a change. The Opportunities Party has the skills, ideas and courage to make real change. Don't leave change to chance. Party vote top.